Welcome to the Write Good Books podcast, the audio companion to writegoodbooks.com with your host, Jason Boga. And welcome back to the podcast. I'm Jason, and joined again with our co-host, Scott Michael Childers. How are you doing today? I am fine. Fine. Good. 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 I'm fine, too. Cool. <laughs> Dude, I think today we're going to talk about fair use and copyright and trademarks and the difference between them and how it affects us as writers. So I'll hand it to you, Scott, and have you tell us the difference between the three of them because I think you deal with it a little bit in the day job. I do. I do deal with it a little bit in the day job. But first, let me throw out this disclaimer. Neither Jason or I are lawyers. This is not to be construed as legal advice. This is just for your information. Mm -hmm. This is what I get from having folks in the legal profession in my family. So, anyway. This isn't like Law and Order, where you can just watch a couple episodes and know it all. No, no. In fact, we are just going to scratch the surface in this. There's a whole lot more for you to learn, and some of it is actually very interesting. Some of it is not. (laughs) But anyway, let's talk about trademark and copyright. These are two different things, and sometimes people use them the same yeah, way. They're and they easy are, to confuse. And, and they both protect intellectual property rights. So they're both in that genre. However, copyright, it, it protects specific works. So we'll copy, copyright this book, this TV show. Now, does that mean this physical formatted copy, is that copyrighted or is it just the text? Th- this form of the book. Okay. So not the, not the single book, but the way it has been edited and put together and So that, that specific print. That yeah. edition. Okay. Right? Uh, it, it, again, there's going to be a lot of nuance. Mm-hmm. So before those of you who, who have a lot of understanding come back to me, realize this is a 15-20 minute shot. We'll clarify questions mm-hmm. later on if you have them. But it, it, it's, it's going for a particular work, whereas a trademark, it's protecting a brand. So a, a Mickey Mouse episode is going to be under copyright. Okay. Mickey Mouse is trademarked. So the idea of using Mickey Mouse in all sorts of things, you could be violating a trademark. Mm-hmm. Trademark has no fair use. Copyright there is a possibility of fair use. So there are differences. So this is why, another reason why I'm kind of against fan fiction is if you're using someone else's, someone else's characters, more than likely they are trademarked. Now trademark, you have to actively receive that protection and you must actively keep that protection active by going after potential trademark infringements. So... If you do not actively try to protect your trademark, and then later on you go to court to say this person is using my trademark illegally, mm-hmm. that person can point to all the times you did not protect your trademark, and that weakens your case. This is why those big companies sometimes are kind of heartless when they go after trademark violations, because they have to to protect it from. They have to protect the trademark so that way if something big comes up, there's not a history of ignoring it. Okay. See, I was always under the impression that that was to set an example, saying if it happens to this person, it can happen to you, but that's not necessarily the... It it is setting an example. Mm -hmm. They're setting the example. It's saying this trademark is valuable to us. Oh, yeah. So you're right. It sets an example, but it's kind of the opposite of the way Mm -hmm. you may have been thinking about it. So this is why I discourage people from using other people's characters. Mm-hmm. Now, some of them are trademarked, some of them aren't. We'll, we'll throw that out there. Okay. But it's best to, to create your own stuff. Yeah. Now let's talk about copyright. Okay. And you mentioned fair use. Mm-hmm. So I've seen people throw things onto YouTube. They'll throw up big snippets of text and say, well, this is protected under fair use. I'm using this for fair use, no profit intended, no copyright intended. Well, here's the thing. It doesn't matter what you say. Those disclaimers are worthless. Fair use is only a defense in a courtroom. You cannot preemptively say this is fair use and be protected. All right? It's only something that's used in the court. And the only person who can say this really is fair use is the judge. 
not you, not the IP person, the judge. So I, I've seen this on YouTube. People throw up whole episodes of TV shows, mm -hmm. movies, sporting events, and will say, this is under fair use. No, <laughs> it's not. You're, you don't have the right to do that. Copyright protects the creators. So, so what? When would a fair use defense work? Okay. Well, here's the thing. There are four things that a that a uh, it's a test that would be used in a court case to inform the judge's decision if it's fair use or not. So let me pull that up here. And we're kind of doing this backward. Talk about fair use before we talk about copyright in general. But we'll, we'll see how it goes. For fair use, those four tests are the purpose and character of your work, of, of you, the, the person who wants to use someone else's material. What are you doing with it? Two, the nature of that copyrighted work. Three, the amount and nature of the portion taken. Mm -hmm. And four, the effect of the use on that on the potential market. Those are the four tests. And some people will go through those and say it's a checklist and if I mark all four, I'm good. Well... If you mark all four, you probably won't get attacked with a mm -hmm. copyright suit, but it's not a guarantee. Mm -hmm. So the purpose of your use, if it's satire or parody, you could use a whole lot of the other person's intellectual property. That's protected speech. Is it educational? Are you transforming the work in some way? Are you doing a review or a critique? So those are protected uses. Not just throwing it up onto to YouTube, say this is for historical purposes. That's not really a, a, a protected use in most cases. The nature of the work, the second test. If it's mostly factual, you're probably okay, right? If it's, hey, the weather outside today was sunshine and rain and it had an average temperature of 37 degrees Celsius, whatever that would be at. <laughs> That's a fact. It can't be copyrighted. Okay. But if you were, say, copying a whole paragraph out of a fiction book without citing, without pointing to the original case, that would be the nature of that work would be not geared towards fair use. The amount and substance of the por portion used. I've heard people say 10%. If you use less than 10%, it's okay. No. There have been court cases in music for for a snippet of song that's mm -hmm. shorter than two seconds. So... Yeah, I've heard that. You know, there was always... Maybe it's an urban legend. They'd always say if you want to use 30-second bumper music... Yeah, and that. you hear these yeah. movie clips or mm -hmm. TV clips of, of dialogue. Here's the thing. They're not using the most important parts of those movies or mm -hmm. TV shows. And that's where that substance oh, okay. that uh, of the work comes in. You could use quite a lot if you're not using the heart of the work. Okay. So you're, if you're using a side character's speech, mm -hmm. that's going to be more protected by a fair use defense than, say, the monologue of the main character. Okay. So subjective. Yes, it is. It's very subjective. It is not a cut, clear-cut yeah. thing. And that's another thing we should probably let people know, that fair use defense is not clear-cut. And then the fourth, the effect on the potential market. Now, you want to get confusing. It doesn't have to be same for same. So some people think, well, I'm creating a video game off of the characters of this book. So it's not affecting the book market. Well, that's true, but you could be affecting video game sales of that intellectual property. So that's a potential market that they may not be in, but they could be. So you might be affecting their ability to get money from there, and you would fail that fourth test. So, fair use, like I said, it is, it's subjective, it's fuzzy, it's not very clear. You do your best to stay within those four categories, but you don't know for sure if you've ever really got that down until an actual court case. You do your best to prevent a court case from happening. Yeah. That's what you're trying to do, really. And again, not a lawyer, this is a short episode. We've got to cover a bunch. Mm -hmm. So, that do you want me to talk about copyright? It's some yeah. good news for for writers. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about how copyright protects you as a writer. That's a great thing, and we'll this way we'll end the the session on some good news. <laughs> Here's the thing with copyright in the United States as of our recording date. 
things could change. It has changed in the past. It will change in the future. But if you have written a work, that means it is fixed in a format. And that includes a Word document. Congratulations, you have a copyrighted work. It does not have to be traditionally published. It does not need to be sent to the Library of Congress. If you have fixed it in a form that's outside of your head, it is automatically copyrighted in the United States. Now, other countries have different rules and different laws around copyright. I can't speak to those with any real authority. So, it used to be that you had to send in your work to be copywritten. Uh, you still could, and doing so gives you some extra ammunition in a copyright suit, both if you're pursuing someone who you think violated your copyright, or if you are defending yourself from a copyright claim. Registering uh, within a certain amount of time after you finished gives you um, some, some extra benefits in the court. Strengthens your case, those type of things. Um, so if you've got something, some big work, uh, you might still want to register it with the office. Um, it's not that hard to do. You can find the instructions online. But you do not have to, to be able to claim it's copyrighted. That said, you read something on the internet, you're reading copywritten uh, information because it's been set. It's wow, okay. outside that person's head. It's on a web page. Mm -hmm. It's automatically copywritten. Those Twitter feeds. I haven't reread the Twitter license about who actually owns those Twitter posts, uh, but you could make an argument that it would be copywritten. Again, unless the license for Twitter says we will claim all copyright, and by clicking here, you agree to give us all copyright. Okay. Same with Facebook and those other mm -hmm. things. So my suggestion is, if you want to keep it, don't put it on social media. Yeah. Put it on your own website. Yeah, good point. Um, question on copyright. Yes, sir. So who owns the copyright to a published book? Does the author or the publisher? Well, here's the thing. Part of selling your story to a traditional publisher includes handing over certain rights or maybe all of the rights. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing. Copyright is not just one thing. It is a mix of different rights that you have as a content creator. And if you know what you're doing, you can negotiate with a traditional publisher even mm -hmm. for certain rights. For example, you have the right as a copyright holder to reproduce it, to adapt it. So if I wrote a novel, if I want to, I could write a screenplay based off of it. I could do a comic book based off of it. Perform it. I could read it to an audience. I can distribute it, I can sell it, and I can license it. And this is where this last part comes in for you as a, a writer. What you are doing when you sell it to a traditional publisher is you are giving them license to do certain things. And that's what you negotiate. Um, you're saying you could have all future print rights. So you have all of those rights and I keep none to myself. I'm actually transferring those. Okay. Or you could say, you have the right to publish one run and sell it for this fee, and this is my cut. Now, granted, as a novice writer, you're not going to get that type of deal. Right. At least not without an agent. Um, more than likely, you are going to get at least offered a full transfer of copyrights. That could last indefinitely. It could last 20 years. It could last 10. Who knows? Mm -hmm. But as an author, as the creator, you initially own all the rights. It's up to you to decide what makes more financial sense, more artistic sense, whatever your decision making is, to pass over to a traditional publisher uh, if you want to go that route. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if I should get in the specifics of my own contract on my novel, but the contract on my short stories, uh, they're usually worded the rights will return to the author after a certain period of time. Mm -hmm. Anywhere from one year after publication to six months after the acceptance letter. Some are say, some said instantly. You know, yeah. it's, and this it's, is it does vary. Yeah, and this is where some authors really get into some bad stuff where they, they have a story, they have a novel, and they can never reprint it again mm -hmm. because someone else owns the rights. And, you know, in the recording industry, you've seen the greatest sun hits of Elvis or the greatest capital hits of Sinatra. Mm -hmm. 
Well, he re- they recorded under different labels, and so those labels have certain rights. Um, I do want to say another thing here. There is such a thing called work for hire. So if I'm writing a newsletter for my job, it is my workplace that owns the copyright because I'm doing it as part of my job for them. As a freelance author, uh, this is something we've talked about or will talk about depending on the timing of our episodes. The agreement may mean that you give up all copyright because it's being done as a work for hire type of thing. It's part of a job. So back in my days as a computer programmer, mm. it was the same thing with any code we developed. Belongs to your employer. So some people just assume that they don't have any recourse as an author, that the copyright doesn't kick in until it's actually published by a traditional publisher. That, that's wrong. Mm-hmm. As soon as you've written it, you have copyright. And it's up to you to decide how best to use those rights. This is where self-publishing comes in because uh, there's a few self-publishers out there who do it mainly because they want to retain all the rights. If there's a movie that's going to be made of my works, the the author is feeling that they want to be the one that negotiates that vision as opposed to the publishing house or um, Audible, you know, audiobooks. Mm -hmm. You know, there are some that do... Well, Cory Doctorow is one that comes to mind. He retains the audio rights to his books. At least he did in the past. I don't know if that's current. Because he did not want his audiobooks to be published in a format that contained digital rights management. Okay. So there was a stance that he wanted mm-hmm. to put on the audio rights. And so that's how he's negotiated. At least in the past, I, I haven't checked to see if that's still his stance uh, or not. So copyright is a very important thing that, that authors probably should get a little bit better understanding of what they what they actually own and what they're actually doing when they sell to a, a publisher. So, I, You know, I've heard some other writers say that before they signed a contract, they hired a copyright lawyer mm. to read the contract with them. I didn't in my case. I just ran it by a couple other writers who were, you know, had similar press deals or publish, publisher deals. I don't know if that's a good idea or not. It's up to you. I have also heard of some of the more sinister companies who take all rights forever from a writer and some of the thinly veiled vanity press. Oh, yeah, that's a... See, there's the distinction for me between small Mm -hmm. press and vanity press Mm -hmm. and also self-publishing. It's like, who owns the rights to your works and for how long? Fatty presses, I would agree, are sometimes the worst. Yeah. I've seen lots of complaints about that. And you know what? We are just about out of time, but I think we've got a lot more we could say on this topic, so why don't we make this a two-parter, and we'll, we'll stop right now, and we'll be back in two weeks to finish up on this. So until then, if you'd like to support us, you can check us out on the web at www.writegoodbooks.com podcast, and thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.